For the sake of this assembly and all living beings, please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to leave suffering and attend bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize non-birth. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, Noble and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Sarando Suchedoye Olahudi Samya San Putoshe. Namo Saranto Suchedoye Alahadi Samya San Putoshe. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa by Chien Wan Che Nan Sao Yu. 我今见闻得受持,愿皆如来真实意. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in a million eons, but now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, good evening. Welcome to our Sutra Lecture. This is Saturday night, September 22nd here in Berkeley, California. We're cracking open the Flower Garland Sutra, the uh, chapter called the Ten Grounds, Ten Stages, and we're on number nine starting out. So if that's what you came to hear, you come to the right place. Right. Um, my name is Hung Shur. Uh, we're here in Berkeley at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, and uh, we appreciate the efforts of. If we could knock that off just a little bit, Jerry, it's a little bit too hot. Uh, appreciate the efforts of the folks who are bringing this lecture to you in a variety of forms. We've got uh, a uh, live stream going out over Go to Meeting picked up through YouTube, our YouTube channel called Dharma Realm Live. So that's going out to uh, folks who are sitting in front of their computers, able to, to uh, hear my voice and see the image, watch the text grow. And uh, Also, we have two friends who are in Australia who are using uh, high-tech tools to bring this sound into China, where otherwise... Uh, YouTube wouldn't travel. So that's a blessing as well. So we have a Vietnamese translation live right here in the monastery. So we've got a multitude of languages and a multitude of formats so that the Dharma wheel can be turned and people can uh, go through all these various iterations to find the sutra that is not only uh, on the page, but ideally is spoken in your heart as well. We were uh, having quite a conversation about translation and how uh, various versions of uh, the, the original spoken way back when by the Buddha 
2,500 years ago, they say, then collected first perhaps in Sanskrit, but not all of those pieces are still available, then translated into Chinese and now into English and Japanese, Vietnamese, Tibetan, Korean. Um, and just all of these, uh, you know, changes that the sutra went through. And there's a, another way to look at it entirely, which is to say that when a human being makes his mind quiet, the sutra is there waiting without any language uh, translation required. That the sutra didn't exist until the prince uh, was able to calm his mind and uh, look deep within and came up with the Flower Garland Sutra. So how about that? And it's, uh, you could think that the, the sutra is, uh, in its primary form, is, is just waiting for each one of us, coded deep within, hardwired, waiting to be uh, uncovered, discovered, take the covers off it. Let's uh, quiet our minds right now with the name here, of the Flower Garland Assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And Open your text to page 54 and 55. Last couple pages in the booklet. We're going to transport ourselves to the uh, A place where, uh, where the gods are celebrating. It's a place where the devas are happy. And we know they're happy because they're making music. So that would be, it, is it in the heavens? Well, the devas can travel to where humans are. It doesn't really matter. The, the sutras describe through a 
spiritual vision. So we've got a, a place where um, we, we mentioned last week that they're, they're on our stained glass windows. We have images of devas. Uh, one of them is holding a harp. And that's uh, maybe something a little bit like what's going on in our sutra. So if you can imagine, uh, it's a scene of celebration, of rejoicing, happiness. Okay, um, we're at the very top. Shi shi zhong yao, zhong yue tong shi zhou, right there. So I'll give you a line and you can give it back to me and then we'll go over to the English and do it in unison. Ready? Here we go. Shi shi zhong yue tong shi zhou. So there we go. Bai Qian Wan Yi Wu Liang Bie. Xi Yi Shan Shi Wei Shen Li. Yan Chu Miao Yin Er Zan Tan. Great. Okay, ready? Let's look over the English, page 55. Um, we can do it together. Here we go. At that time, the many varieties of music played in harmony, hundreds of thousands of millions of endlessly many kinds, all through the well-gone one's awesome spiritual might, expressed these wondrous sounds of praise and acclaim. It's describing a scene of what could be called cacophony. Cacophony is where the music is not in harmony and it hurts the ear, hurts the mind to hear music that's in cacophony. This is not that kind of music. This is music in harmony, beautiful orchestral sounds that blend. They mutually amplify each other, they support each other, and when you hear it, it does something to you. Uh, music is vibration through time. And uh, Confucius warned about music that was uh, harmful. He said there, the, there are states called Zheng and Wei, where the music, if you hear it, it does bad stuff to you. It makes you want to misbehave. And I thought, yeah, rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> That's, we know what that does. The devil's own music, right? Um, he said, no, Confucius was serious about it. He said, there's proper music. There's music called the shao, which is a kind of an orchestral uh, court music. It's a liturgy. Maybe think of an opera. And when you heard that, Confucius forgot to eat for three days. He was full. He didn't need any other input when he heard that music. It was so delightful. So Confucius, our, our very same Confucius, the, the Chinese sage, the educator, the teacher, he uh, loved music. He was a music fan. But it had to be the right kind of music. And the power of the lewd tunes of Zheng and Wei were so much that they said if it were uh, played with unwholesome intent, these large black birds would fly down to the town surrounding where the music was played and would take the buildings apart brick by brick. <laughs> I think big, big crows coming down, you know, six foot crows tearing your building apart because of the power of the vibrations unleashed by the wrong music. So, got to be careful what you listen to on your Spotify playlist. Be careful. So, um, this is music that is all harmonious. And it's vibrations through time, various pitches, and our cells are made up of um, what's, what's in our cells. Some people will tell you it's waves. Others will tell you it's particles. Others will tell you that it's electrical charges. And electricity is just, you know, 110 cycles per second, 220 cycles per second. It's vibration. So when music outside, you know, when you play that 
And then you, you know, if you amp that up, listen here. You can hear the vibra vibratory nature of that, right? Still going. And it will do things to you. This music played by the devas delights the heart. Um, devas already start out with a lot of blessings. These are gods in heaven. Their bodies are really subtle and fine compared to ours. And they have instruments that just, mm, they totally send our spirit up. I mean, we have people in the room who have a career based upon beats, right? Based upon uh, the alternating uh, rhythms of, of impact and silence. Impact and silence. And the silence around the impact is as important as the, the impact itself. So we know what that does. Uh, there are musicians who, uh, whose fame is based on a beat. Oh, I got that, that new beat. So here the Deva is saying, yes, we want these sounds to come out. Why? They see the Buddha. They want to celebrate the Buddha. That's what it's about. They see the Buddha. They're excited. They're thrilled. They bring that excitement, that energy out in musical sounds. How about that? Um, I live in Australia part of the year, and uh, some there are folks tonight in Australia helping our voice go further. Where I live is called the bush, and the bush of southeastern Queensland translates into forest. It's the woods in Queensland. And the bird life there is abundant and noisy. And I have a book on my reader that says that all bird sound originated in Australia. All bird song originated in Australia. Pretty revolutionary, amazing thesis, right? And I haven't finished it. I'm work I digest it bit by bit. But this ornithologist makes a claim that, that uh, the primal bird sounds are in Australia that filtered out to the rest of the planet and that we can, we can hear them because they're still there. They weren't interrupted. Birds that were uh, making the basic sounds multiple million years ago are still doing it. So, boy, I wake up uh, early and kookaburra sound out before dawn and then after sunset. And they're pretty much the first ones. And they, they're called the Bushman's Alarm Clock. If you're an Aussie Bushman, I mean, you live outdoors, the, uh, uh, you can tell what time of day it is if you don't have any other means by listening to the kookaburras explode. And they go... <laughs> and sometimes there's two or three of them and all at once. <laughs> it's explosive sound. And that's pretty much the start. But then in the next couple hours... There's dozens and dozens and dozens of birds that all make their sound in the Aust Aussie bush. And so I thought, oh man, great. I've got an Irish penny whistle. I'm going to go do bird music and they're going to be so impressed with me. You know, so I got my penny, I'm playing my tunes and they like pay no attention whatsoever to me. Who is this phony? Who is this bozo? pretender, phony, you know. And it's like they don't blink. And I'm thinking, what's wrong? Maybe it's, I'm, I don't play very well. Is that the problem or is it the... So I checked it out. I looked into it. And the, my current theory of how music, many varieties of music could be played in harmony without creating cacophony without creating chaos of sound, hundreds of thousands and millions of endlessly many kinds. There's a theory that says all the different species of birds occupy different places on the sound spectrum, different registers, different pitches. 
and their communication to each other is based on different frequencies. So, you know, remember when we were growing up, I guess Tom would be old enough. If you're old enough here, you remember they had civil defense frequencies, 640 and 1240 on the radio dial, AM dial. And if this had been an actual atomic alert, this is in the days of bomb shelters, you were to turn your AM radio to 640 and 1240 and the civil defense band would give you information. 640 and those were reserved, don't, no other stations could be at 640. And I don't know if that's true any, any longer. But those frequencies, those bandwidths were reserved for civil defense, meaning they would tell you where to go to avoid the, the communist Russian bombs from falling on your head. That was the great fear back then. So, uh, likewise, these birds manage to do all their talking within a certain frequency range, and other birds don't talk there. Something like that. And so it could be they didn't even hear me when I was tootling away on my tin whistle. It's possible, because I wasn't in their frequency range. However, this, the story doesn't end here. Uh, I'm watching, and there's this huge eagle that they're, they're in the tallest trees over close, not too far from where we built our new Buddha hall. And these are major raptors, and they eat happily all the other birds. The kookaburras are large birds. And these uh, eagles eat every other smaller bird. And so when the eagles decide they're going to fly over, they fly high, but their shadow falls far. When they fly, there is an alarm sound that all the birds together pick up. And they all go to cover, and they go... <coughs> They get real small, and they pull in. They don't want to be visible. And the eagle flies by, and the all clear is given, and they're back, and they're doing their thing. So there are calls that cut through every other bird frequency, and they all hear it together. Isn't that interesting? So there's, some, there's a certain sound that kind of like the... Um, I don't know if people are aware, but the campanile, the UC Berkeley campanile, plays its bells at noon every day. And most of the time here at noon, can't hear it. It's just too noisy. There's freeways on two sides, three sides. There's planes going by. There's helicopter noise. But on Sunday, and sometimes on, on a quiet weekday, you can hear the music from the campanile here on McKinley Street, which is about a mile. And... That cuts through, and you can hear, oh, beautiful carillon, bell music. So something like that, that sound travels through, and, and everybody in the neighborhood can hear it at once, you know, something like that. But the, there, is a, there are songs that uh, tell every bird in the bush, take cover now, regardless of what frequency you're posted on. When that sound happens, everybody go, pulls in. Interesting, huh? So, the birds have got a lot figured out, and they have for thousands of years. So, at that time, many varieties of music played in harmony, hundreds of thousands of millions of endlessly many kinds. Why isn't that just totally white noise, right? It's not. All through the well gone one's awesome spiritual might, the Buddha sends out his Wei Shen Li, his amazing, awe-inspiring spiritual strength sets this into harmony, expressed these wondrous sounds of praise and acclaim. Notice there's a colon at the end of acclaim, meaning, and we're going to get to hear it now. Here's, it's coming. That colon, two dots there means, and here it is. Get ready to listen. So here's what the music says. Ji jing tiao ro wu go hai, sui so ru di shan xiu xi, xin ru shu kong yi shi fang, 
广说佛道悟君生。The calm and gentle, free from defilement and harm, cultivates this practice skillfully wherever he goes. His mind, like empty space, reaches all places in ten directions, extensively explaining the Buddha's way and awakening all beings. All right. Like I said last week, we were in the section that was narration, the narrative, just the story going along. It was just the voice of the storyteller, telling us、uh, what was how things were set up as the,、uh, the ninth stage began, and、uh, bodhisattvas arrived. They jumped into the air together. They stayed in the air. They sat in the air together, and offered gifts. Made offerings to the Buddha. These bodhisattvas are almost, you know, Buddhas themselves, but they occupy themselves by making offerings to the Buddha. That's apparently something you want to do when you see the Buddhas. You want to create a relationship with him. You want to give things to him, so that you have that tie of of benefit, benef beneficial, beneficent. Helpful ties to each other. So,、uh, the Maheshvara,、uh, that deva, was there and just、uh, made all kinds of beautiful gifts. And then,、uh, devis, women from the heavens, came and made special offerings. So, the genders here. This is one of the few places in the sutra where gender is even mentioned ever. Interestingly, this is interesting. Uh, we do find out in the Ganda Vyuha in the chapter thirty-nine that there are half of Sudhana's good advisors are female, but the gender issue is not、uh, emphasized at all. It's pretty much gender-free, but here celestial maidens, millions of them, come so happy, and they made music. Okay. We've now heard that twice about music, and what does the music say? The sutra says, "Now let's go into what they're singing." Here's the lyrics of the song. It's as if it were, you know, subscripts,、uh, subtitles on the video screen. You get to hear the lyrics, and they say they're praising the Buddha. They say the person who is calm. The person who is gentle, the person who is undefiled, who is harmless, has no harm, cultivates his practices. Probably should be plural, not this practice, but these practices. What is it? Sui so ru di shan xiu xi. According to、uh, according to whatever stage this person masters, they're good at cultivation. That's what it says. Okay, and Xin Ru Xu Kong Yi Shi Fang. This is such a, a, a strange Buddhist praise, right? Somebody says, "Boy, you know what I like about you the most? Your mind is just like the air." <laughs> I th thank you. I think <laughs> your mind is like empty space. Like it, it wouldn't seem to be a, a compliment, would it? But it is here. The Buddha's mind is like empty space, and what is it about space? I mean, here's some. This is perfectly good A1 quality space right there. What is it about this space? Is it goes everywhere? There's nowhere it's not. You can't go anywhere, anytime, anywhere, and not find space. And that's true inside our bodies as well. I I really enjoy that description of. Atoms, a t o m s, an atom of whatever element you're talking about. They say that if you weigh, and you can get an atomic scale, if you weigh the weight of individual atoms of elements, most of the area of each, we're in a Particles and quarks and things like that. Most of the area 
of every individual atom is empty. The weight, no matter the weight, doesn't matter what weight it is. But if you take, think about it. Remember in high school science, you had those little models of uh, a nucleus and then protons and then neutrons and electrons. And they were buzzing around. And that was kind of the space age. I think NASA's original was planets circling, circling the sun. NASA's first logo. And so every atom is mostly empty. The, I guess you think of it as the space described by the electrons buzzing around the nucleus, mostly empty. There, there's very little matter described by each little thing if you go down into the tiniest level. So in other words, our bodies are mostly space. And what holds us together, you could say electricity. Well, what is electricity? Well, you could say it's just habit. It's just repeated action. In other words, karma. Action is karma. It's just karma is action. Say it again. What is karma? It just means things we do. Value-free. No good, no bad, no judgment, no wholesome, no, no negative. It's just repeated action and its results. The hook part is where you get the results of our, where I get the results of my action. So if I do it a lot, I make a trail through space, there's electricity in that trail, and it exists. Stop the action, it doesn't exist, right? And the electricity goes away. So if my body is just mostly air held together by repeated action, then Empty space is the fundamental nature of me. You go, yeah, yeah, I get that. Likewise, they say, you know, what do we think about, what's the most solid thing in the world? You say, well, the ground, the earth is solid. Mm -mm. They say, if you take a handful of the earth and you actually go look into it, lots and lots and lots of air element in the earth. It's layers and layers of different communities of Mostly living beings permeated by air. How interesting. That is mostly air. When you think about space, we think, you know, you go here. I can point to, if, if, this was, if the air wasn't here, you couldn't hear my voice. It wouldn't travel from my voice to your ears. But what this does, what this way of looking at it does, is it flips it around and you go in to find the space. And you go small to find the space. And... The smaller you get, the more space is there. Interesting, huh? So, okay. The Buddha's mind is like empty space. And it's actually helpful to think about that. Um, if I, when I reflect on my mind, you know, what's in there? It's, I don't have a real solid picture of what's there. It, the Buddha's mind is... It's, it's empty of emotion, for example, empty of moods. The Buddha doesn't have mood swings. He's not moody. The Buddha doesn't have uh, prejudices or biases in his mind. He's a living being. He's in nirvana, but his mind is very much alive, and yet it's not full of rage and anger. You know. One, here's this, I know... The more I go in this direction, the more woo-woo it can sound. And it's actually not. Um, one way to find out what's in your mind is to sit down and meditate it. <laughs> meditate your mind. Right? Put your mind into a place where your six senses are not engaging with the, the world around you, and you'll discover what's on your mind. And oh my goodness... I, I love to tell the story about my first real meditative experience was at a place called Antaiji in Kyoto, 1969. Um, and I was in a, this Zen temple. And Antaiji at the time, every month, did a seshin, jie xin in Chinese. And a seshin is a qi, it's a Buddha, it's a, it's a chan, they were a Zen monastery, zazen. 
you sit and meditate for one week in silence. They did silent session, silent, you know, Chan retreats. And I had no idea that I had a mind that had stuff in it. I just, like everybody, just kind of go ahead and straight forward and do stuff, right? But when I sat down and I wasn't doing anything else for, for 60 minutes, and then you stand up and you do walking meditation, which is super slow. It's called kinhin, jingxing. Because the temple's tiny, it's Japan, and you're crowded in there with people. And so you're, every step you take is half the distance of your foot. And you go half your foot. And then half your foot. You're walking like this. The guy's right behind you, somebody right in front of you. you know, like that for 20 minutes. And it's like that and uh, so what you discover is what's on your mind suddenly and because you know where to run and eight hours a day of sitting still and then walking this way together with people crammed into this tatami zendo tatami floor zendo and uh, what I discovered was what's in my mind is everything that I put in front of my eyes or ears my entire life is in my mind. No mistake, no accident. Every TV commercial I've ever watched, every song I've ever listened to, I replayed 13 Broadway musicals, one by one by one by one, all the songs from My Fair Lady with the accents intact, you know. Every Elvis Presley song I ever listened to, <laughs> you ain't a nothing but a hound dog, barking all the time. And I'm like, no, let me meditate. You know. Oh, <laughs> and uh, the kids in Bristol are sharp as a pistol when they do the Bristol stomp. Whoa, whoa. it started in Bristol. Da -dee -da. <laughs> wop to ba, wop a to ba. They've got a new dance and a name like this. The name of the dance is the peppermint twist. Bop boo ba bop ba la ba shoo ba. And, I, oh, and I'm just enduring my mind, spitting back the contents of everything I put in front of it. Song after song after song after song. And after the, the top 40 hits came the commercials. You know, I pan a toothpaste. See the USA in your Chevrolet. America is asking you to call. You know, Blatt's beer, Goodyear tires. Oh my goodness! On and on and on. Things that I had no idea that I'd learned. I learned. So why am I telling you this? It's because how do you know your mind's like empty space if you don't even know you've got a mind that has like any of the other senses, like your e eyes, like your ears, like your nose, like your tongue, like your body, has been experiencing impressions, recording impressions of thoughts all your life. And the moment that is the, the aha moment, the eureka moment, is when, after being bombarded by your own tape recordings, there's a pause. There's a little 10 second silence. And as soon as you notice it, guess what? There's another thought. Suddenly there's something there again, right? And you, you just, oh, hey, that was quiet for a minute. No, oh, come on, you just broke it, you know? If it's, if it's really quiet, you don't know it's quiet, right? But as soon as you notice it, it's no longer quiet. But there's that moment when you go, a little break in the inner chatter that you earn through hard work. So this thing about the Buddha with his mind like empty space is not woo-woo, airy-fairy, sky pilot nonsense. It's hard work. Because the mind is just like a muscle. It's just like your eyes. Whatever you put in front of it goes right in. You got it. It's yours. Now, do you hang with buddies who use the F word all day long? Guess what's there? That's your soundtrack. 
you know. <laughs> so remember my story about Howard Swanson, the vegetarian cowboy who went to the mines to work as he was growing up in California? And he said, oh, yeah, those miners, he says, they're a dirty bunch of men. They're dirty outside with the cold dust, and they're dirty inside with all the foul things they say and think and do. And Howard Swanson, in order to keep his mind pure, because he was an unusual guy to work in the mind, he memorized Omar Khayyam, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. And he would recite it one way backwards, and he would recite it forwards, and he would recite it backwards again, and recite it forwards, just to keep his mind clean. Howard Swanson, the, uh, the foreman of the Hearst Ranch, William Randolph Hearst, Hearst Castle, this is the foreman of the cattle ranch, he was an extraordinary man who wanted to keep his mind pure. So he understood that whatever you feed it, you got. That's, what it, that's what's there. So here's the Buddha. On one hand, he was not feeding it all the stuff that we put into our minds these days. How many Facebook posts have you looked at? How many Instagram feeds? How many you know, news broadcasts? That's there. Not only did he not feed it that stuff, but he patiently waited out all the things that were there already. So hard work to get to a mind like empty space. And how do you conceive of your mind? This all started with my saying, how do you imagine your mind? Is it a place? Is it a screen? Do the things that you think appear in a screen? If you grew up learning Hanzi, Chinese characters, do you think in terms of Chinese characters or sounds, or do you think in ABCs? That's an interesting question. You're, you meditators, anybody ever count your breath? Shu Xi Guan, right? What, what do you see? Spanish? All over the place, yeah. Me too, that's what I learned. So, but is it Spanish or is it A, B, C, D? It's English, right? Yeah, English. Grew up in California, so. Okay. Maybe if your folks keep speaking Spanish, you'll be bilingual. That'll be nice. Talk to grandma and grandpa. So, um, the, if you count your breath, we often, you know, we, we teach counting, you know, one, inhale. What do you see? Do you see letter one? Arabic numeral one, two. Do you see Roman numerals? Do you see E, R, San? How, what's your inner language, right? How deep does language go if you're trying to get to a mind like empty space? Oh my goodness. Ichi ni san shi go roku shi chi hachi kyu jiu. Un, deux, trois, quinze, cinq, six, sept, huit, neuf, six. What are we, how do we... What's the, the noise inside our minds, right? So, why are they praising the Buddha? The Buddha's been through this and sat there long enough until his mind got quiet. And when your mind gets quiet, you know what? You're happy. The, the state of the mind is what? Just like no boundaries, contains everything, no filters, no me in the way. There's no critic in there going, hey, I love that more that. Hey, wait a minute, you can't take, that's mine, give me that. You look like me, you can be in this country. You're different, you don't belong here. You're not an American. Imagine the size of the mind that, that rejects anyone who doesn't look like you. Forests hold a lot of trees. The ground does not reject the roots of any tree that's growing. So we should be more like a forest. That's the way nature built it. So the Buddha's mind is like empty space. It reaches everywhere. Nothing doesn't fit. If your mind is like empty space, you are never, ever a stranger. Wherever you go, you are welcome. You are family, not just with humans, but with all beings. Right? So... How nice. That's called what? Liberation. No fences. No fear. Ever. What's, there's no limit. So why would you be afraid? So extensively explaining the Buddha's way 
and awakening all beings. Okay, this last line takes us into what the Buddha does with his mind like empty space. He's helping people wake up. Helping people, helping us get past our limitations, our boundaries, our fears, our hang-ups, places we're hung up. So, that's the first stanza. It's a praise. This is praise. Ooh, boy, oh boy. It is one of the glories of Christianity that it's called a praise tradition. And a lot of your time as a Christian is when you're together celebrating is praising. You praise Jesus, you praise God, and Buddhism does the same. I was thinking about um, how we first tried to get the Amitabha praise together, ho ho, in English. The Amitabha praise, this, we have lots of praises in Buddhism, a lot, a lot, a lot. And uh, one of the, the uh, ones that we do every single night is, It's a really beautiful praise. And it's been sung by so many voices over so many centuries that it's kind of grooved in there. It's a beautiful praise. That melody, they say, probably a melody from the heavens, a deva melody. Same melody for earth treasury bodhisattva, same melody for guan yin. Guan shi, guan yin, pu sa. Right? And it's a great melody. And then it, when you're done, then you go, Namo Amitofo, Namo Amitofo. We talked in the bus going to Buddha Root Farm about the three, the three melodies that we use, three different melodies. So that's great in Chinese. But what if you grew up in the West and you go to that and you think, eh, it's nice Chinese music, but have you got anything in English? What do the Westerners sing? I don't want to necessarily learn Chinese music in order to recite the Buddha's name. It's nice music, but you mean there is no religious music in English? Oh, come on. You know, start with Bach, Handel, the Messiah, you know, oh my goodness. So, yeah, we have plenty of religious music in the West, but how do you bridge them? How do you cross over? So, uh, early on, David Rounds, bless his heart, was the guy who jumped into the gap and <laughs> tried a whole bunch of different praises of Amitabha. And we tried them all out at Gold Mountain Monastery, a city of 10,000 Buddhas. We'd try, he'd teach us and we'd listen for a while and go, <laughs> not there yet, doesn't have it, doesn't, doesn't do that same thing, that Amito, which is a beautiful praise, right? So we, we came down to it. We discovered that if you want to have a successful praise of a divinity, of it's this, look, the calm and gentle one, free from defilement and harm, cultivates this practice skillfully wherever he goes. His mind, like empty space, reaches all places and ten directions extensively explaining the Buddha's way and waking all beings up. That's a beautiful... Look at the things they pick out of the Buddha to, to say is good, you know, praise. Cheng zan ru lai. Extensively praising the thus come one. So what are the things that a good praise has to have? Number one, it needs to have the lyrics, the words, clear. Um, here they are. These are really nice lyrics. Ami and and uh, Ami Tofo Shenjin Si. Amitabha's body is colored gold. That's the first thing that our Amitabha praise says in Chinese. So that's one. The lyrics have to be well translated. Okay. Number two is the melody has to carry us up. 
It's actually physical. You think of the chakras, right? These energy centers in the body. And if the melody drops down, it's not going to be right. Melodies that drop down are good for certain things. Dancing, for example, right? You, when you want to uh, get out and dance and move your body around, you want a melody that, that, takes, that makes your feet move. Banjo music makes your feet move a lot. You know, how do you feel when you hear na 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 dum 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 The cream, right? Ginger Baker pounding on the drums. Eric Clapton in his first appearance in, you know, the cream. I've been waiting so long. It's, it doesn't do, <laughs> you know. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Ave Marie. You know, totally different experience. It, it vibrates different parts of the body, the vibrations we were talking about, right? And it's got to have that. It needs that if it's going to be a successful translation of sacred music. Call it ecclesiastical, call it sacred. Okay, and then there's a third part. And the third part is the hardest one, which is when you sing this praise, it has to give you a feeling of purity and or transformation that when you're done singing it you're different and better than before you sang it that's hard to define isn't it? but it, you just you feel it um, the uh, there's the doxology in my Methodist background the doxology is the name for one of these short praises that they do two or three times per Sunday and it goes Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghosts. All together, Amen. Okay, and that's that's like that's a very nice, you know, da di da di da 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 dum. Simple da da di da di da dum. Da da di da 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 di da 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 dum. Just takes you up, and it's not that it's pitched high, but it's it's like you're done. You go, ah, good. I've I've just now, I'm I've put a foot into the heavens. That's the feeling. And that's very successful according to the Methodists so that we do it over and over again every Sunday. So those were the challenges for we budding Buddhist hymnizers, right? Hymnologues, our ecclesiastical liturgists. And oh my goodness, we would hear one and have two of the three pieces but not that third piece. Or it had a good feeling but the melody was too hard to sing, too complicated, or it had the feeling in the melody, but the lyrics didn't fit, right? So, what have we got now? We're not there yet. And I, this, I don't want to sound critical, but nobody really loves our Amitabha praise at this point. It's the best one, but we're ready for a new one. Amitabha's body is the color of gold. The splendor of his hallmarks has no peer. The light of his brow shines round the hundred world. I don't want to sound critical. That sounds snarky, doesn't it? Now, if I did it with respect and with the right tone of voice, you'd hear it and you'd think it's okay. But when I hear it, I'm, you know, I've, I told you my ear is full of, I have about... 40 Irish drinking songs in my ear that I can do. Maybe someday I'll go back again to Ireland. Fill them up again, lads. You know. And when I hear Amitabha's body, the way it's done, I think of an English drinking hall. Amitabha's body is the color of gold, the splendor of his whole school. 
And like, no, don't do that. You know, that's not fair. So we can do it. Amitabha's body is the color of gold. Okay. It depends how you approach it. It's not the, the sun. But it's almost there. It's not quite there. And so I challenge myself and like, well, don't just criticize it. Come up with a better one. You know, you can't say something nice. Don't say anything at all, right? Why are you so critical if you don't have a better Amitabha's praise? So I'm putting that out there to the, to the interwebs. We need a new, better, improved Amitabha praise. The other, now David, uh, it's almost there. It's pretty close. He is not critical of that part. The part that he's critical about is where it goes, um, Bright as the seas are, his eyes pure and clear, shining in his brilliance by transformation, the Kant Bodhisattvas, and infinite Buddhas. Forty-eight bows will be our liberation, and nine lotus braces he reached to the shore. Homage to the Buddha of the West. You have to go from, you have to take a half step up. He's critical musically. Nobody does it right, unless you're musical, right? Um, see. Forty-eight vows will be our liberation. In nine lotus stages we reach the farther shore. Homage to... That's back up to a natural. Homage, instead of homage to the Buddha, everybody takes it in the same pitch. That's not the way it's written. It's written, you have to... And he's, he says, That's a, that was not successful. He says, you know, and yet, we, I guess that was the last one he gave us. So we used it. Right? And we need another one. We need another better Amitabha praise that doesn't sound like a, you know, kind of. I, I can't get, you know. So we're still working on it. And the lyrics are okay. Um, I don't think it has to be a translation of the current one. I think somebody can just recite the Buddha's name see Amitabha in your mind and write from there. doesn't have to be a slavish translation of Amitabha's body is the color of go old. Right? It's go old. Amitabha's body is the color of go old. You want two syllables, not gold is one syllable. We stretch it to go, it's go old. You know, it doesn't fit quite. We need a new one. And it's time, where it's not fixed. We've only been here a hundred years, you know. <laughs> Buddhism was in China. When did uh, the Mi Zan, you know. Now, there are other praises that we haven't translated yet. We had, there's a fantastic, wonderful Bao Ding Zan. Ah. Really beautiful. Ooh, that song gives you goosebumps. And there, you know, we just, we need to keep working and don't stop until it's there yet. So praises, praises, right? We've got um, the, mind you, uh, some others in our yellow book are super. We've got an earth store bodhisattva praise that was written by Paul Hopp. Really fine. Earth store bodhisattva, wonderful beyond compare. It's really mystical kind of sounding and a little edgy and sounds like it might have done a hero song from the hells, right? Where Earth store lives. Namo Earth store both great vows and compassion. Bodhisattva of the dark and dismal realm. Very nice. That's really, really nice. And David Rounds' praise to Guan Yin is just super. And they should do it at City of 10,000 Buddhas. Bodhisattva Guan Shu Yin is wonderful past gratitude. That one always makes me feel 
better, you know, closer to Guan Yin. So we've got a couple that are real hits, and some are still, but Amitabha, the Buddha's praise is still working on it. So I'm, I'm hoping that somebody will be inspired, somebody with musical talent. So what else happens here? Tian Shang Ren Jian Yi Che Chu Xi Xian Wu Deng Miao Zhuang Yan Yi Cong Ru Lai Gong De Sheng Ling Qi Jian Zhe Yao Fo Zhi Everywhere in the heavens and among humans as well, he makes adornments appear incomparably fine, all born from the Tathagata's merit and virtue, an inspiring delight for the Buddha's wisdom in those who see them. How about that? This is the praise. We're into the song, right? These are the devas here just saying how fine they think the Buddha is. Um, They said that he's calm and gentle, free from defilement and harm. He's a cultivator. His mind goes everywhere and he teaches, helping us wake up. And he's in the heavens now, but now he's among people. He's down here, and wherever he is, it says he makes adornments appear. Xi xian wu deng miao zhuang yan. What do you do with that line? The Buddha makes adornments appear everywhere. Isn't that? It's like, what does he do? We um, we we installed a new turntable in the back of the, the monastery in the dining room. Because we have, uh, I am of that generation that has 33 and a third LP vinyl records. I couldn't believe it. Our, our distinguished noble bhikshu, Jin Chuan, right? Grew up in Saratoga, Stanford grad. He's watching us like pull the, the LP out of its protective paper sleeve. And he said, oh, I've never seen a record. Talk about old. God, I'm instantly like, oh. You know? <laughs> I've never seen a record. Like, okay. This, this is called a record. <laughs> it's this black thing with grooves on it, and it's about that big, you know. 33 and a third LP. And he said, yeah, I, I saw those, uh, I guess they were called what? Uh, uh, compact discs, you know. <laughs> For him, CDs are like laughably ancient, you know. 33 and a third LPs, he's never seen one. (laughs) They're mythical, (laughs) you know. Oh, my Lord. So both Doug Powers and I have a a record collection. And uh, Doug Doug actually, his because I left home, so my record collection stopped pretty much. Uh, I never owned a Beatles album, mind you. Doug has pretty much every Rolling Stone album including the hard ones to find. So we got we have Sgt. Pepper, and we've got all the Beatles albums. We've got uh, Stone's Beggar's Banquet, and he was big into the early jazz musicians, Sade and Hubert Law, the flute player. And think, you know, pretty uh, dated, mind you, but it's the 70s, 60s and 70s music. So anyway, we got a new uh, turntable, and uh, plugged it in and got it set up. And one of the albums that Jin Husher brought down to test it was Fantasia, the soundtrack to Walt Disney's Fantasia. Six sides, three records. And I remember in Fantasia, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, you know, and, and Mickey Mouse is the sorcerer's apprentice, and he screws up, and the sorcerer, he causes a flood to come in. And I remember in Disney, it's animated, and they've got classical music, Bach and Beethoven and Brahms, and, and to accompany Disney animation. And the sorcerer waves his wand, like Harry Potter and Hermione, and these the, the waters recede, and wonderful things come out of the sorcerer's magic wand. And 
How does the Buddha make adornments appear? Incomparably fine, both in the heavens and among humans. Born of his merit and virtue, and when you see them, you are delighted with the Buddha's wisdom. What could it be? I mean, imagine. Um, yeah. Things would be natural, wouldn't be uh, neon, you know, nothing you plug in. But the Buddha is able to, with his merit and virtue, make beautiful things appear, decorations. So that you, when you see them, you're, you know, you're delighted. Um, people come into the monastery here, and one of the first things they talk about is the smell. Remember the kids, uh, we have this relationship with Piedmont Middle School, just across the Oakland border. Piedmont Middle School comes in, 300 kids in one day, uh, and the kids come in and they go, it smells nice in here. Yeah. What's that? You know. And we say, oh, it's incense. Oh, incense. Oh. So that's a kind, you know, adornment. There's vibe. The Buddha would make the vibration really wholesome. And every, you know, why, why do bodhisattvas of this uh, nearly Buddhas themselves, why do they specialize in giving gifts to the Buddha? They're not trying to hook favors, you know. They're not lobbyists, you know, <laughs> trying to get votes from the legislature. That's not what they're about. They're, uh, th spontaneously, they, they're moved to do this. This comes to them right away. They want to do that. Uh, people saw Master Hua and they bowed to him. They wanted to bow to him, strangers, because he bowed for 10 years himself, 800 times a day, twice, and on their behalf. So people, it's funny, huh, how these connections happen. So um, the Buddha makes adornments appear, wonderful things that when you see them, you're just, you know. Um, oh, one of the, the things that happens to people when they get out of a car in the redwoods, People, you know, they've been driving along Highway 9, zzz, zzz, curving, curving, curving. They get out of the car somewhere in Boulder Creek or Ben Lomond, you know, or uh, maybe at Big Basin. Um, and the first thing is they go, and the smell of redwood forest touches their nose, touches their skin, and they feel cleansed in an amazing way. And then they see the light. And the light in a redwood forest is green and red. And it's because the sun has to come down through these incredibly tall beings. And if you stand at the base of the redwood trees and you want to see the sky, you can see it directly overhead. But if you look here, there's only green, green needles, right? And here and here, there's green needles. The trees are too tall. They cover the sky. And there's an adornment. Is the light and the, s the smell. So the light is your eyes. The smell is your nose. The feeling is your skin. And the sound in a redwood forest is muted. And like that. Spectacular. So, you know, it's don't, don't think neon. Don't think anything that plugs in. The adornments that the Buddha makes happen just might be something way basic. Something that we've forgotten about because we've got too many people putting out our products. Greenhouse gases and stuff. So, yeah. Sometimes it's what's missing that, that is the shocker, right? So I, I think I told this story already. I uh, was spending the night last week down in, in uh, Boulder Creek at our 
Redwood Chan Monastery. And it was sunset. And uh, Jin Fo had said, there's a, there's a plastic can of deer feed that you can spread out there just in the back. So I looked for it. Sure enough, there it was. And I took a plastic cup about this size, and dipped it in, went out, looked around, okay, put a little bit here, but there, and went back inside, and I was standing at the sink, and I saw a whoop, shadow go by. It's like, whoa, just 10 minutes later. And I looked up, and here's two mama deer and one fawn. And clearly, the fawn belonged to one of the moms. The other mom was probably a sister, because they often travel together, two or three females but not everyone is, has a baby every year. So mother, daughter, and sister there. And they were happily scarfing down the corn and seeds and uh, roughage and stuff that was in the, the deer feed. And it was like, wow, that, didn't, that was like 10 minutes, you know. Right away, I, I just hit it right when they come by in the evening. And... Uh, so I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I was trying to get pictures out through the window, but it went very, you know, lots of stuff in the way of the window. So I thought, okay, well, see what happens, you know. So I turned the door handle and <coughs> opened the door really slowly, you know, and peeked my head around, and here's the deer. watching me, and I'm going, mm -hmm. and here it is, you know, and the deer, like, takes a step forward. <laughs> and what I'd expected, as soon as the sound of the, the door cracked, I expected, no more deer, gone, you know, because mostly that's what deer do when they see a human, especially a mom with a baby. Uh-uh, not that. <laughs> Deer's like, uh, can I have some of that, you know? <laughs> Another step forward, two steps forward, and I'm like, oh, okay. I got my camera in one hand. I got the, the two steps, and the deer takes one step forward and one step back, and eyes are focused on that in my hand, you know? And I noticed, and of course the baby, the, the fawn, her white spots are pretty much all gone now. You can still see the outline, so she's about probably eight weeks, two months old. And... Uh, the, uh, uh, the deer were pretty skinny, which is to say it's dry and the rain hasn't come. So they're, they're grass eaters, they're herbivores, and they're hungry. <laughs> that had something to do with it, the fact that the mom was really hungry. But uh, I kept walking forward, and the deer took a step forward, and cautious, and the baby's watching mom. And it was really clear that if I had taken the time and had done this repeatedly until they got used to me, they, I would be feeding the deer. And uh, then uh, I talked to Phil, who drives down, and he said, oh, he said, I bet they all miss Jin for sure, don't they? And I thought, oh, he's trained them this way. They think I'm him, you know. <laughs> This is just normal. I just, I'm filling in for what he's already done. And I asked him about it. He said, no, he hasn't. He's never like hand fed them, but they come really close. So what's the point? There was an absence of fear in the deer. And probably it's okay. Some people right away would say, oh, see, you've actually harmed them because they're going to go get up next to some other person who's afraid of them and shoots them. You know, well, but there aren't that many people down there. I did. I went bang, bang, bang. Let him know it's dinner time. He was, he was there. Well, I, yeah, he found it. But boy, he, and interesting, again, what I saw was that uh, the maternal protection instinct is deep and strong. The sister of the mother doe wanted to come down and eat. And as long as the baby, hold on one second, be right with you. As long as the baby is eating, the 
No other deer can come close. She attacked her own sister, which I've seen happen before. Beca and it's that, you know, it's my fawn, you wait. And so the extra, the deer number three had to wait until mother and baby had gone. But then what's like heavier still is when it's time for the yearling, who's now grown up, to separate, mom turns on her <laughs> and knocks her out of the circle, knocks her out of the feeding line. So it's like there's a clock running on all this. When she's only pregnant, they're sisters. They're together and everything. You know, take turns. As soon as the baby comes, there's the mom and my, my fawn. Get out of the way, right? Then when the fawn grows up, it's like, oh, suddenly you've crossed the line and you're now competition for food and you go off and find your own circle. Fascinating to watch. So... Yeah, what, uh, what's missing in the Buddha's adornments is, number one, no bloodshed. You notice there's no violence in this sutra? Anybody ever pick that up? Buddha's sutras, no harm. Not that they're not real. They're real. They're not fairy tales. But they, in the Buddha's world, people are subdued by goodness. They're led on by feelings of well-being. If your cells are vibrating because of the what the Buddha has set out in his field of energy, if his mind is like empty space, you're not afraid of him. There's no threat. There's no harm coming to you. And who's hanging around the Buddha the scariest demons of the spirit world are there with their palms together looking at him, thinking, wish I could be free too, right? The Yakshas, the Gandharvas, the Kinaras, the Garudas, the Mahoragas, the Tin, the, the, da the dragons, the devas, the dragons, and the eightfold spiritual pantheon follow the Buddha like puppies. And each individual one of them are the heaviest characters in the spiritual world. What's a yaksha? A yaksha is a, is a flesh-eating ghost. They're called su jigui, right? And when they see the Buddha, they're like, someday, you know, me too, you know. Not hashtag me too, different, different. I want to be as fearless as you are. Yakshas are in ghosts, but they're, they're spirit realm, but yin, you know, and they're, they're bound up. And they look at the Buddha and they say, you're, you're free and we want to be like you, you know. So, man, oh man, no violence in the sutras because you don't, if you're completely full and vibrating and happy, and feeling full of dhyana bliss, chan yue wei shi fa shi chong man, if the dharma joy fills you up, who are you going to punch? Right? Who are you going to curse when your mind is full of light? Uh uh. So, adornments, what's missing here? Everywhere in the heavens, among humans as well, he makes adornments appear incomparably fine all born from the Tathagata's merit and virtue, inspiring delight for the Buddha's wisdom and those who see him. What was the deer seeing in me? Pretty clear, food. They, I could count the ribs in the deer. You know, it's dry down there. There's nothing green until it rains. Question in the back? Mani, no? Okay, that was a stretch. What was the question? Can somebody magnify it? What did he say? Oh, oh, there's a microphone. I want the Piedmont Avenue. You want to see your? School. I want to that school. Oh, you want to? You went to Piedmont School? Yes. Oh, but you're not a sixth grader yet. 
If you're a sixth oh. grader, you can come to visit the oh, monastery. I was talking about a different one. Yeah. When you get here, you can say, I go there every Saturday night and I listen to the monk. Great. Yeah. Those students are real bright when they come. Really nice to see them. And some of them can sit in full lotus immediately, and some their legs are like butterflies. They're just, they can't. It's not that every kid is flexible. Interesting. Yeah. Some have good roots. All right. So we're in the midst, we've been talking about praises and the whole praise tradition. Um, we can do one. Have you got your songbook there? Uh, let's do that first one. Page 12. See what you think. This is my version of a praise. And it's, it's actually has a, an original. And the original is what we sing on Buddha's birthday. Tian Shang, Tian Xia, Wu Ru Fo, Shi Fang, Shi Jie, Yi Wu Bi, Shi Jian, So You, Wu Jin Jian, Yi Qie, Wu You Ru Fo Zhe. Familiar upon the earth, below the sky, the Buddha has no peer. In ten directions everywhere he is beyond compare. Amazing Grace, maybe everybody's favorite Christian hymn, um, and everybody knows it. So <coughs> I've had good luck. Um, Amelia, you need a hymn, hymnal, you need a songbook there. Page 12. Um, everywhere I go around the world, when I say it's Amazing Grace, not a problem. People sing along immediately. Singapore, man, we had the whole audience singing. First night, first five minutes of the lecture, everybody sang Praise the Buddha. We ready? Upon the earth below the sky the Buddha has no peace in ten directions everywhere he is beyond compare he's gone beyond to He's never born again With wisdom bright He blesses me He knows my joy and pain He walks the noble mill away with strength and purity in dark of night and light of day his kindness touches me. He's not divine, but he's awake. He's neither come nor gone. I find each blade of grass He is the wisdom son Okay, listen to the guitar here. Wow. 
last verse. I've searched around this whole wide world, and now I can declare you'll never find a wiser one than Buddha anywhere. One more time, last two lines. You'll never find a Sounds good when everybody sings. That's nice. Yeah, good stuff. All right, so praises. Praises are powerful. And it's not artificial. When people see the Buddha, they think, wow, that's good. Whatever you've done, I approve. I like it. So singing is one way. Some people dance their praise. Others draw their praise. Others are moved to make offerings, to make gifts. But in general, there's a sense of, ha, ah, that's good. That's good. Alrighty, our time has come to conclude this lecture. We'll continue with the praises of the Day of Yees and Day of Oz next week. And turn to the back of your songbook, last one, Dedication of Merit. I've got a quick video that I'm going to show you, something praiseworthy, just real quick. That's only three minutes long, but it's a great one. Um, then we got some announcements, and that'll conclude. Um, dedication of Merit. One place that you could dedicate merit to, should you care to. States of North Carolina, South Carolina um, are afflicted with some 6,000 lagoons of what's called swine effluent swine waste, it's called. The, uh, less polite, we call it P-I-G-S-H-I-T, right? You can spell it. Um, there's millions of pigs in North Carolina. Ham uh, comes from there, Smithfield ham. And what they do is they just take what comes out the other end of the pig and put it in a lagoon which is at water level, and the storms have flooded those. And, along, and they've been there for years, and along with all of that stuff that sounds terrible to mention in a sutra lecture, are lots of toxins, lots of, just even the fact of nitrogen, nitrates like fertilizer, right? When that stuff gets in the groundwater, which it does immediately as soon as the lagoon breaks its banks or floods over, suddenly it's in the river, it's in the creek, it's in the sewer. And where does your drinking water come from? Right there. So moms feed their, they make formula for their babies out of water that has high nitrate content and you've got a blue baby. That's to say, the oxygen doesn't bond in the blood and babies turn blue and it can be, they, they never recover. Uh, they have brain damage. And that's the water now in so many places in the state where pigs by the tens of thousands have drowned. And not only that, their effluent, their pig waste is now liberated and it's in the water. And that's a mess. And then when it dries, 
it's going it, to, the, the smell in any one of those pig farms, they say, is just unbearable. And that's normally when it's working. You know, now it's not working. It's, uh, they, not every one of the 6,000 lagoons has broken its banks, but s they know that 66 of them have, and they've sent drones up and shown it. And it's different color, and that color is now seeping out into the, into the flood water. So it's going to coat your house and your driveway and your sofa. And these folks have to live there. So what are you going to do? That's a problem. That's a big, big problem. So in sympathy for the, the human-created problems, you know, what's that? We like the taste of pig. Called pork, called ham, called bacon. Who doesn't like the smell of bacon? Well, I used to back when I ate meat, but I don't eat it now. And if, you know, it's just, it's just come home now. These problems that we, for the, for the sake of that sizzle and flavor, we do this. We grow pigs and kill them. And sentient creatures are, you know, they're, they too need to flush their toilet like we do. But we call them food. And so now what are you going to do? What are they going to do? So I read that and just, oh man, that's a problem. I spend weeks of every year in North Carolina. And I, I know how beautiful that land is. So, gulp, you know. So we can dedicate merit and hope folks find a way out. Eating vegetables is one way. Here we go. as one and radiant with light share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness luminous and bright if people hear and see our hands and hearts can find in giving unity May our minds away to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light Dispel the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Alrighty. Um, actually, uh, Jin Hosher, why don't you make the announcements while I get things set up here? Have you got a microphone? Maybe Connie will. And I'll Get our slideshow underway here. Jin Husher will talk about coming events. Um, so next week we have uh, an have earthquake. to be louder. A bit louder. Okay. So next week on Sunday is it uh, Tom? Is it one thirty? One one p.m. So we have Tom Broker, who um, I've just confirmed is well. He's world renowned uh, and his speciality is in earthquakes. So, 
Did I get it? So yep. Tom's going to be here and he's going to give us a talk on how to prepare, um, how to get ready in case an earthquake happens and that includes having a, a go bag. Uh, what else Tom? Getting your house earthquake ready as well? Yeah, so don't miss um, next week Sunday at 1 o'clock at, at the Buddha Hall and then our Berkeley Buddhist Monastery weekly classes are, are back um, again as the same schedule. We have Amelia on Monday. Um, if you have any questions, Amelia is sitting right there at the back of the Buddha Hall. And then um, we have Wednesdays, uh, Stephen Tena, Thursdays, Inside Meditation Group. Fridays, Mardi's Six Petrak Sutra, and then uh, Saturdays will be like today. And also next week, we have the, on October 6th, we have the San Francisco Library Exhibition, where we're going to show uh, photos of Shufu when he came, Venerable Master Hua when he came to San Francisco. And we, ha some of the, I think we have close to maybe 60 to 80 photos. And um, the photos are going to be like this. This particular one will be about 100 inches wide. So the photos are going to be big. They're not going to be small like this. <laughs> so this one is going to be 100 inches wide. I, I believe that's it. No, OK. That's great. All right, thank you. Um, the uh, storytelling class that we had today was tremendous. Um, Brian Conroy gave his first lesson on storytelling. Had 50 some people, as we heard, and uh, he's going to do another one next week. So if you go to berkeleymonastery.org, you'll find out how to uh, find out more about that and how to sign up. All right, what have we got here? Um, my friend Amy White is. Uh, Partner, musical partner and wife of Al Petaway, um, guitar uh, composer and teacher. Amy is a musician, pianist. And all. She and Al live in North Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountains up high, uh, way up high. And they have uh, wildlife that we don't have in Boulder Creek or in Australia. They have bears and copper, copperhead snakes and foxes and all kinds of critters way up in the mountains. Uh, anybody who read Cold Mountain, the, the Civil War novel, they come out of their house and look out across at Cold Mountain. So you know how, how wild their neighborhood is. And Amy has uh, planted trail cams along the trails where she lives. Just these, uh, you know, always on uh, cameras and so she has been watching all the critters coming and going and she's she posts Fairwood Studios uh, Fairwood Studios is her YouTube channel and she recently got uh, she they have a big hammock out on their their mountaintop home and a mother bear with two cubs discovered the hammock and she's got like 12 different videos, and this is the best one. And I, I saw it immediately. I watched it like three times, and I, I, I shared it on my Facebook page because this is priceless. So, and it turns out it's a thing. Hammock Bears is a thing on YouTube. So, here we go. Mom is just as playful as they are. She's enjoying it. And she leans back just like a suburban housewife, like a soccer mom. She's enjoying the hammock, yeah. playing with her kid, while the other kid destroys the hammock, yeah. has fun. 
Okay, and then the baby down below and mom get into it. And she doesn't know that she's holding, balancing the kid on top. So they're wrestling. Having fun. Okay, so she pays attention oh, to the one down below. And the kid up top. Lands on his head. <laughs> And gets right back up and goes, do it again, Mom! Do it again! That was fun! And Mom is like, this is too good. That's mom on the ground. She's like, oh, yeah. (laughs) She's posing on the ground. Look at mom. She's like, oh yeah. (laughs) Hammock bears. Isn't that good? To be continued. So... She says her comment was, "Uh, at long last, here's the Hammock Bears video I promised. I'm so jazzed that there's a lot more where this video came from. Keep an eye out. I'll be posting more. Uh, The video may be my favorite of the lot because of the various hilariously anthropomorphic poses, just like people, that Mama Bear strikes. She's quite the character, isn't she? She's brilliantly playful. I've compiled lots of bear family footage over the years. I've never seen a mama bear be quite so playful with her cubs. It's a joy to witness. Watching this series is a bit like watching a three-ring circus. I can always find something new to enjoy with each viewing. I hope the same thing happens to you, too. If you enjoy this video even half as much as I do, you'll find that life is indeed very good, at least for three minutes at a time. The footage is from a series of videos I've taken in the garden of my western North Carolina mountain home, I've captured footage of other bears playing with the same hammock as well. It seems our place has become quite the popular hangout. It's likely this video series has spoiled me for other critter cam footage that I can capture in the future. Not that I mind, my heart is full. Thank you, Mama Bear and Cubs, for bringing much needed laughter into the world. So if you go to look for hammock bears or go to Fairview Critter Cams and you'll find it. And then she's going to be uh, posting more uh, as the as it goes, so I want to see one more minute of bears, the baby bears. This was the best one before. One of them's chewing on the camera as we start. So. Buffering. There we go. That was the best one so far, but now we've added a hammock. So, <laughs> so this is goes to second place best video.
All right. So if anybody wants to uh, see this again or pass it on, look for hammock bears, two M's. Or go to Fairview Critter Cams. Fairview Critter Cams. And then look at the... She's got lots of deer and bobcats, pileated woodpeckers, buck in the snow, coyote comes by with a deer's head. Oops. Ooh. Got to see that one. Yeah, that's, that's a hot one. Ooh. In the snow, in the winter. That's a big score for the coyote, who looks pretty well fed. That's not a starving coyote. No. So the critter cam is good at night, too. So, Yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go. Hey, hey. So we're going to definitely invest in a critter cam for Australia. <laughs> yeah, me too. So we're not sure what we'll see at night in Australia, but uh, many things come out at night only. So probably things we've never seen during the day. All right. So see you all next week. And uh, keep one way definitely to keep North Carolina in mind is to consider uh, a plant-based diet. If we didn't eat the pigs, we wouldn't have to breathe their excrement. So, all right, let's bow to the Buddha. Anybody who would like to see this photo is welcome afterwards. This is an amazing photograph of Master Hua with his American Sangha, the American monks and nuns, back when that's all there was. Was Caucasian monks and nuns. I'm. Uh, this is before I left home. This is 1973. Yeah. Yeah. Hung. Yeah. Hung Jing. Hung Qian. All those names. So this is one photo of which there will be 60 some at the San Francisco Library on October 6th for three months. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master.